Hello, I'm John Sanders with Bond and Picaro in Washington, D.C., and I'm delighted to um, begin my next um, office hour segment with Ted Chamberlain, who's the principal industry strategist for technology and media um, at Workday. Uh, Workday is going to be making a presentation at the Media Financial Management Association conference coming up in Jacksonville in May on the subject of leveling up your back office to meet gaming revenue growth in 2024 and beyond. So I always like exploring new areas and getting into gaming is most certainly one of them. And um, I particularly enjoy doing these office hour segments because I feel like I'm taking a walk through different sectors of the media industry. And today I feel like I'm walking in the front door past the studios, <laughs> past the offices of the content creators and into what's affectionately known as the back office where the finance and human uh, uh, relations and development functions take place. Uh, and maybe back office is somewhat of a misnomer because it's really the backbone of the industry uh, in gaming and media because uh, just kind of like the uh, bone system, it's somewhat invisible, uh, but it's what allows us to stand tall. Ted, welcome. And um, just as kind of a, a, a high level kickoff uh, question, you know, there are always buzzwords that come to dominate the field that we work in. And now everything's about technology, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. digital transformation and the like. Uh, as a global question, does that mean that people have become less important or mm -hmm. paradoxically, are they more important than ever? Well, John, first of all, thanks very much for having me. So excited to do this. And as you walk through the back office, this is gaming. So hopefully you're wearing your hoodie and your Air Jordans because we want you to fit in. OK, we don't want you. Well, to feel I, like I got a long way to go. Us. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know what? I just forgot your question with my witty uh, with my with my witty response. Can you, can you do it one more time for me? <laughs> are people becoming less important, or are they more important than ever? Yeah, interesting question. Uh, I'm definitely going to lead to the sense that people are becoming more important than ever, right? Because when you have all these technologies, all these massive shifts, shifts and disruptions, you know, there's still a human element that actually has to guide and make some decisions at how to invest, how to move, where to do it, and when and and artificial intelligence is is such a great reference point for that. You know, Workday. You know, we think things like AI and ML aren't there to they're there to unlock human potential and actually not replace it. So I'm a big fan of you know they still need us. The robots aren't going to take us over and do our jobs anytime soon. So uh, hopefully there are ways to help people to do their jobs better and probably a lot of pitfalls that if things aren't ex executed properly, uh, we'll end up doing our jobs worse. So <laughs> what are some of the disruptions uh, that you're observing in the gaming industry today that really need to be addressed? Uh, yeah, interesting, John. So I think this has to be the most unstable time I've witnessed in the gaming industry, if not, if not most industries. And it was really brought on by the pandemic, right? The pandemic was just crazy for all of us. But for the media industry, so things like streaming and gaming, um, it presented a massive opportunity for gaming companies to capture brand new eyeballs, right? We're all sitting inside, bored as hell. Um, and what do we do? We reach for the gaming console or we stream some Netflix for a couple hours. And the gaming companies and publishers took advantage to the point, uh, this point in time by overspending on titles and projects and just putting more content out there and not really realizing that, you know what, this could end. Um, but now it's time to pay the piper, you know, they, and they are paying the piper for their over exuberance and trying to, and now gaming companies really are trying to align spending and revenue plans. Um, so that's number one. It's just this post pandemic world is really, it's hitting some of these, you know, these media companies a little harder. And they're just, they're really having to try to figure out what was life like before the pandemic? You know, how did we, budget for projects, you know, how did we create slates and titles before we had all these people now that they're kind of gone. So that's number one. And, you know, the, the downside of that is the industry is also um, undergoing a fundamental change where the small, the small independent studios, maybe the indie studios or the double A gaming studios, 
they're really fighting for their lives, John. They're hanging out. They're hanging on for dear life as the big, large behemoths, the AAA studios, you know, they, they're they continuing to invest in the major tentpole titles like Halo. Uh, the all, everyone is just waiting for 2025 when Grand Theft Auto 6 comes out in Borderlands. Um, the big publishers realize that's where they have a considerable, almost guaranteed revenue stream. And and this really, this shift, you know, small versus large is will inevitably lead to increased industry consolidation, uh, the m and activity. And there's just one other area that I think is super interesting that doesn't get as much publicity as it should as far as disruptions. It's the delivery lens, right? So game, distributions, game distribution is moving from, I'm going to go to GameStop, remember GameStop? and buy a CD, you know, buy a disc for a game, that's phasing out. And now it's console, so I have my, I have my, uh, my Switch or my Xbox. The GameStop even uh, used to be right piece. next door to the Blockbuster. <laughs> there you go, right? Two wonderful places, right? Everything in one-stop shopping. So it's going from, you know, uh, uh, PC and, um, and, uh, and disc to console, uh, to downloadable content, right, which is we're all comfortable with, and now it's moving to cloud delivery and games as a service, and this is a major shift in supply chains and revenue models for gaming companies, so there is no lack of turmoil in, in this gaming industry for sure. So specifically then, if I'm the, the CFO of a, of a gaming studio, um, what's keeping me up at night, and how might that be addressed uh, through back office solutions. Uh, you'd mentioned originally the most commonsensical keeping revenues and costs aligned. Uh, mm -hmm. When times are good, there's usually not much of a limit on the costs. Mm -hmm. And uh, when things start to become a little bit more mature, um, there's a big management issue that arises. Agreed. And John, everyone in the office of the CFO should invest in a big bottle of Ambien for sleep as there is so much disruption going on in gaming finance. Um, like you, you nailed it. Um, game studios over accelerated title and project development, right? To meet that demand. They put revenue over profitability, right? That's the cardinal sin, but when you're in it, you know, that's what your investors, that way, that's what your board is telling you to do is revenue, revenue, revenue. So um, that decision has come back to harm uh, many business models in a very material way. So, if you're in the office of CFO or you're a controller or a CFO, now's the time you have to work much closer with the development teams to ensure that the production schedules are on time and on budget. That is absolutely critical. Uh, they also have to make some really tough calls to, to uh, deprecate in-flight projects. If uh, there's another project that could be more lucrative, so you're going to maybe scrap that project and then take and allocate those funds and those budget to more strategic projects. Um, another critical area for the CFO, and this one actually can help drive responsible growth, funny concept, right? Is proactive of becoming uh, an expert in supporting emerging monetization models and avenues. Uh, that's really fascinating. You know, there's this thing we see in the media industry called uh, transmedia, right? So it's the marriage of film, retail, and gaming. So it is... Um, uh, Netflix making a Roblox movie, right? So you have streaming and gaming together. You have, you know, Netflix, um, well, Netflix here, uh, having, you know, uh, retail stores in certain areas. So we see this sort of marriage of retail, gaming, and film come together. Great opportunity for the gaming companies to, to get their IP out there and, um, and, and make some more revenue streams and also add support in gaming, right? You know, we see uh, the ad supported model being widely successful in streaming and in uh, other sort of TV viewing ways. Now the gaming industry really needs to look at, you know, how we have different tiers of games for people based upon, you know, what their, what their budget or uh, their wallet will allow them to do. So, you know, we think these are new frontiers. And I personally think, you know, the office of CFO needs to be front and center um, on how to monetize these and how they really affect the balance sheet. So, you know, so that's the fun part. So I would, <laughs> I, I would be remiss if I also didn't mention uh, the importance of CFOs for being, you know, the adults in the room and supporting compliance standards as well. Um, you know, when I speak to whether it's within the MFM committees or our customers or industry peers, you know, gaming companies, they have to strictly adhere to a lot 
of standards, um, especially in, in the finance and accounting world. So definitely U.S. GAAP. Um, if you're an international company, IFRS uh, 15 and ASC 606, a lot of acronyms there, right? So there's a lot to be done there. So honestly, John, I think the job the CFO has never done, and they probably are going to become nocturnal because they will never sleep. Um, how big is artificial intelligence playing into the various uh, platforms and services that you're offering? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, right now, you know, we are seeing that there's an opportunity. So I think as an industry, we've moved beyond conversational AI, right? We, we've, we've moved beyond chatbots and using, you know, I think we've got a good handle on that. Now with generative AI, you know, we think it's got amazing opportunity to help practitioners uh, you know, take away some of that manual work or work that's not automated. So if you're a recruiter and you are creating job descriptions, you know, sitting out there and trying to type something up, if you had an AI tool set that would help pre-populate, uh, you know, job a job description based upon a skill set and then boom, automated, automatically created, that's going to you know, make your recruiter so much more um, uh, uh, efficient and, uh, and again, we have this concept where when you're recruiting, when you're recruiting for talent, you're not looking for a job description, you're looking for skills, right? So it's more, you're not searching for a candidate, you're matching candidate with skills. And we worked there, we just made an investment, actually we made an acquisition of a company called Hired Score uh, this past month to help us do that. So we do think that right now, uh, AI, especially gen generative AI, is going to sit right next to a knowledge worker and just help them be way more efficient and take you know, the monotonous day-to-day -day off their plate. So you've sort of segued into my next question. I, I Frankly, I got a little bored sitting in the CFO's office. So I'm <laughs> going to walk out the door down the hall, and I'm now in the head of human relations. Nice. And so what's keeping that person up at night? And yeah, most definitely. It's kind of just touched upon something, but are there other things? And uh, sure. And are there yeah. any solutions? I assume there are no easy solutions. Yeah, John, definitely. So again, ambient is needed in the office of the CHRO too, right? Lots of things going there, but for a slate of different reasons, and they're serious reasons. You know, I'll tell you. You know, the the first sort of disruption there that keeps uh, you know the chief of people, the chief people officer up, is talent, right? So we know in the gaming industry people are the most valuable commodity. Exceptional talent is mandatory because it's creative. When you develop a game and you know, create the storyline and green light and the storyboards all the way to production, that is people. Sure, they use tools, but you need talented people to do that, uh, to, to publish those engaging titles and games. You know, however, if you take a look at the stats, the game industry has undergone significant layoffs due to M&A, scrap projects and really rebalancing of workforce uh, and right-sizing their workforce to getting it to, you know, uh, pre-pandemic levels. So, you know, there is definitely a need for the CRHO office to engage in workforce planning and labor optimization, definitely to ensure that that talent is needed, is effectively recruited and matched. You have to retain that talent. And also you have to have a robust, you know, skills, um, program and database to really let those core workers upload their skill sets to keep them engaged. Um, that's number one. The other issue, which is just something we just have to address, is that um, the game industry, it has a DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion problem. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of high-level uh, press out there in the game industry um, that they are not providing safe and growth-based environments for women and LGBT Q employees, right? You know, there's some really high level. We won't name names, but there is a there is a definitely a a a DEI problem in this industry. So we believe that gaming companies, you know, it is critical to invest in systems and platforms to monitor employee sentiment and ensure an equitable uh, workplace where everyone feels like a sense of belonging, right? I think once we have that nailed, we're going to get our handle a much better handle on how we can deploy a workforce that's happy and um, that's actually productive. So, you know, we think game studios put themselves in the, be in the best position to do that. You know, again, if you, if you walk between, if you walk down the hall from finance in, in CRHO and then, you know what, you build a bridge, right? So we think at Workday, you make the best 
decisions when you blend people and finance systems together. So you so you can see the entire field when you're making a decision um, around workforce, which is people related, but it's also finance related. So we think we think that is critical than sort of splitting those two areas as silos. Go ahead. One other specific question uh, before we wrap up. You know, in this super crowded, turbulent marketplace, uh, one of the new other acronyms that's floating around now is FAST, free advertiser-supported television, almost back to yes. the future. Yeah. So I guess that we could have a con uh, concept called um, FASG, free advertiser-supported <laughs> gaming. Is that something yep. that's made any type of an inroad? And could you see it getting more important? Uh, sure. Yeah. You know, definitely. There is. Um, it's already happening in in that in uh, FTP games, so free to play, right? So Candy Crush and some of these other games that that are free to play that have ads that have ads popped up. But where I think this will evolve is that the intelligence of uh, gaming companies and advertisers to to insert games to sorry to insert ads that. Uh, that are relevant to the demographics, the age, um, and sort of, you know, the region of where, where people are. And, you know, it's interesting, the, the media space and streaming uh, is really struggling because Google, our friends at Google, have finally uh, have a, a um, uh, they decided to deprecate the cookie, right? So the, the, the tracking element. So that's going to make it harder to gather first-person data um, from your users, but so we see that the gaming companies are going to have to be creative. But yet, yes, sir, we definitely see that that you know, ad support and free to play games uh, are going to be probably at least you know, thirty or forty percent of revenue of the entire market of gaming. Well, Ted, thank you so much. Um, I think today we've at least uh, identified what the pressure points are, and we'll look very much forward to seeing you uh, in Jacksonville and diving uh, into all these issues in more granular details and uh, hopefully getting better visualization on the solutions. So thank you so much and have a safe travels. Thanks on YouTube. Don't forget to pack your hoodie for Jacksonville. Good enough. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, in the diversity area, you need more super boring guys with blue striped shirts, I think. That's called equity. <laughs> okay, good enough. Good luck. Thank you. And uh, safe Appreciate travels. It. Thank you very much.